brought to I feel uh, almost overwhelmed by the generosity and uh, the love expressed by Mohan and all of you on this occasion. Uh, thank you very much. And as we get the laptop uh, in this one, I wanted to thank uh, Mr. Joseph George, the President of the MPA, and all the members of MPA and all those who have come here. Thank you for joining us online for uh, honoring me by being uh, with us this evening. You know, this is a very special month to talk about spirituality. We had the Easter, we had the Ramadan going on, you know, Ramadan is a very, very important uh, one. Then we had Ram Naomi, we had Ugadi, yesterday we had Teg Bhavdur, 400 years celebration. What more could we ask to talk about spirituality than this particular thing? I also want to specially thank Mohan and the team for choosing this, this topic rather than the other topics like uh, mental health, mental illness, rehabilitation, other things. Because as Mohan wrote in his email, this is a topic very few people talk about in professional circles. And I hope to leave you by the end of the next 45 minutes to rethink your own thinking on spirituality. My own assessment of spirituality and mental health is spirituality is the cultural resource for mental health which is available to each one of us if we decide to use it. Something similar to the solar energy. Solar energy is there everywhere but if you put a solar cell immediately you can have hot water, you can have electricity, you can do all sorts of things. I personally think that what we have in our spirituality is this one. And I will do this by two or three methods. One, I will share with you a couple of personal experiences in the last 40 years, what makes me say that spirituality is so important. Secondly, obviously in an organization like this, we will look at some scientific evidence to look at spirituality and mental health. More important than that, I also want to spend a little time why we have used this term neglected resource of India and go on to share with you what we can do at the level of individuals, families, communities and professionals to make spirituality an essential integral part of mental health care. No, if you look at the slogan just there, the words hope, concern, guidance, sharing, all of them are spiritual terms. I don't need to say more. Similarly, if you look at the logo of Enhance, Samadma Yoga Uchayate, it says equanimity is the goal of all existence. So there is no reason for us to think that spirituality is not important. But at the same time, as Mohan pointed out, very often we are afraid to talk about it, use it, utilize it and make it grow up in the country and give it to the rest of the world. Of course, we will immediately say yoga and meditation, we have done it, but there is a much bigger, like my teacher used to say, is to say, you know, oh, why are you happy with a few petals when the whole garden is there? You know, something similar to that, spirituality is like a garden which can perfume everywhere in the world and I will come to that in a minute. Very briefly, the reason why I gave a very brief one was I thought it would be easier to talk uh, without too much of a personal uh, glorification which often happens in our uh, Indian meetings. I have born a Hindu, had 10 years of growing up in a Christian community in Bello, 10 years of living with Sikhism and its uh, great traditions in uh, Chandigarh, learned about Islam and Judaism in uh, Egypt, Sudan, Somalia, Jordan, Palestine, Israel, visited Israel and Palestine more than once and of course have been working with disaster populations which really stimulated me to think of spirituality as an important part of life in general, mental health in particular. Before I go further, I also want to share a special relationship that I have with UTC. One of my classmates, Usha Samar, 
is the daughter of Professor Samar, who used to be a professor of religion, history of religion at TTC for a long time. Similarly, another friend of mine, classmate of mine, has written a fantastic uh, uh, religious article, an unexpected gift in one of the Christian journals, talking about her son, who is now 46 years old, severely disabled, who taught her what spirituality is all about. This article about 12 pages long is really fantastic. I just read out one line. To care for a person with disability, there needs to be transitioning of the mind that comes from the heart. Then she goes on to quote many Christian things. In the 12 pages, you see her every crisis being responded to using the spiritual resource. And in a couple, Keith and the, the Madhu and the Keith Gavin and their child. I also want to recall the 150 years of Arvindo, Sri Arvindo, by quoting one line which is very important for mental health. Pain is the key that opens the gates of strength. Pain is the key that opens the gates of strength. It is the high road that leads to the city of Egypt. What a beautiful one from the Savitri. Right this week, there is a whole week of Savitri Jagar going on in the in this area. More than anything else, you will hear a little bit more about it in detail. Recently, two weeks back or two months back, the ex director of National Institute of Mental Health in America, who retired a couple of years back, gave, has written a book called Healing. Our part from mental illness to mental health. I will tell you a little bit more about it. As part of his presentation, you have the link in the handout. He says, He who has a way, why can live without almost any harm? Further, one of his colleagues, Marshall Lady Han, says, If you want to reduce suicide, give people something to live for. What more can you find than spirituality to live for? That is the running theme of my presentation. Of course, we Indians play pride of our spirituality. As Dalai Lama said, India should share its ancient knowledge. And we are doing it in yoga meditation, but there is a lot more that needs to be done. I am not the first person who is talking about uh, this topic. There are a large number of people, I'm sorry, it's a little upside down, large number of people who have talked about it. Professor Abraham Bandis, a friend of MPA, talked about spirituality and mental health in 2008 in the Indian General Psychiatry. I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Then the president of the Indian Psychiatry Society, Dr. Bolecha, chose that as a topic for his uh, presentation. Professor Vinko Brown, Professor General Dick, earlier Dr. M. V. Swami, and as I was mentioning earlier, Dr. Anna Ha, a friend of India, a Swiss psychiatrist, has written a beautiful book on Hippocrate and Heretic, talking about her religious contact, being a Christian and living in a Hindu country, what it meant to her. And Dr. Bish, who took the idea of spirituality to WHO in 1985, and Dr. Sanjana talked about positive mental health. Number of people have talked about it. So what I am talking about it is bringing those ideas to you in a condensed manner, not that I am saying anything new by myself. In the recent times, we just lost Avdeh Sharma, fantastic spiritual leader who brought out this book of spirituality and mental health in 2009. Another couple of Indian psychiatrists like uh, Dilip Jaste, Dinesh Bukra, all have written, Manoj Sharma, have all written about the spirituality of India and its relevance to Western world. Particularly interesting is the book of Madhu Varataka Sharma who has written a beautiful book on anxiety and basic wisdom and I mentioned that in a minute or so. Sorry, you can't come in there? Start doing that? Yes. I'm oh, sorry. Stay in the back. If you want to hand it to yourself, I don't need it. shock you what is happening in America that at this moment 
everyone is confused what we should be doing about mental health as many of these recent books have shown. But our ambivalence towards spirituality to mental health has been there as recent as 40 years back. Dr. Karsfes, a British psychiatrist of uh, tremendous eminence as well as a friend of India had this to say in a, in a cautious manner as he said in 1980, he said one has to He had this to say, yeah. what did I leave it to you to handle? Uh, okay, okay, thank you. He said, one has to admit that there is little firm evidence that either meditation or religious observance significantly modifies tens of thousands of Indians, young and old, have become disciples of teachers who support them, but we don't have any evidence. And he goes on to say, if it could be established that with appropriate controls, the changes in the symptoms and personality do come from yoga, meditation and other things, it will be a great contribution. Similarly, Dr. Venko Brown said about uh, 10 years later, 15 years later, India is an ancient, cultural, spiritual, anthropological laboratory. Nevertheless, to be satisfied with the glory of the past is to turn the wisdom into a fossil. He calls for the theme of my talk, interpret the world from a new point of view, is to revitalize the past and bring in a fresh life into the current time. So what we need to do is not keep talking about the glory of the Vedas or Upanishads or anything else, but to convert it into a thing which will light the current time. All over the world, as you have seen in the next time comes, you see that the interest in spirituality is coincided with the starting of the MPA in 1972. In the graph you see that almost no publications were there in 72. Now it has gone up sky high. This was the 2012 data. Now it has gone up still further. Yesterday when I googled, when I PubMed Central, they showed 12,000 articles and 10,000 of them in the last 10 years itself. So it's a, it's a huge area where everyone is giving a lot of people. Now the question that you will ask me is if spirituality is so important, has it been tested out by the pandemic? After all, pandemic affected all of us. If it is something which is useful, is there any evidence for us to think that it happens? David Sridhar, who works in Edinburgh, just published this uh, book, How a Preventable. She has this statement to make. For humanity, the challenge now is to take up open wounds of the COVID-19 that has been exposed and build a better world moving forward. This is a challenge for the whole world and I am suggesting to you humbly that by using spirituality, by making spirituality an everyday part of our life, we can achieve this goal. But I will come to that a little later. Before that, let's talk a little bit about mental health. Mental health is in a crisis. Many of you would have heard about the Lancet Commission on Depression, which was published in February 22. Lancet is publishing another commission report in September on stigma and discrimination. Two months back, there was a major paper on public mental health in Lancet. You all know about that, the inclusion of mental health in the budget of 2022 by Sitaraman, Nirmala Sitaraman and 23 centers to come up. The current place, the editorial of the Indian General Secretary talks about public mental health and the Chandigarh has been recently designated as a public mental health center and the setting up of the Global Center for Traditional Medicine by WHO with something like 2,000 crores being put by Indian government, 250 million dollar, is indication that there is something everybody is looking for. But we have a crisis. As this psychologist from uh, uh, Australia says, Western consumer culture is creating a psycho-spiritual crisis that leaves us disoriented, bereft of purpose. How can we treat our sick culture and make ourselves well? Similarly, this was the headline of a, uh, the Journal of American Medical Association published uh, this week. Push to the limit 
one in five physician tend to leave practice and says, I am burned out, what we are looking for is healing. Just imagine people talking about healing as a term if they would like to talk about again and again. The most important is the next one. This is uh, Thomas Hinsel. He was director of National Institute of Medical Health till a few years back. He has published on the February 22nd of this year this book, Healing Our Path from Mental Illness to Mental Health. It's a fantastic book. And this uh, uh, YouTube is there in your uh, handout, the link is there. Please do take time to see it. The point he makes it, I borrowed this slide from him since it was available in public uh, domain. He says there is a crisis in behavior in health. America, which has something like 700,000 mental health professionals, that is 400 times that of India, not 400%, 400 times that of India population wise, is not able to address mortality in terms of prevalence, lack of employment, housing, incarceration, lower life expectancy and poverty. And he makes a point that I'm really sorry about this. If I can get rid of this, it will make it easier. Yeah, yeah, next one, please. So, what, what he points to saying that all other things, whether it is childhood pneumonia, even AIDS, heart disease, stroke, all of them have come down. There is a better prognosis while the suicide has gone. Drug abuse, induced deaths in America, every day 100 people are dying of drug abuse, overdose. Today, drug abuse is a crisis of the mind as well as the spirit. Similarly, he talks about the lower life expectancy of the mentally ill, low employment, high incarceration, and he says the solution is people place purpose. People in terms of strengthening the people, place in terms of decreasing the discrimination like childhood experience, poverty, racism and other things. Much more than that, he says the most important thing that we need is a feeling of purpose. The slide that I started off with, that we need to give back to the people a purpose to their life other than the material things, which is spirituality in my understanding of it. Then it talks about that we have unprecedented progress in neuroscience and behavioral science technology, we have effective interventions, yet outcomes are no better. The reason is that we have medical solutions, but the solutions have to be social, environmental, political, and I would add spiritual. I will tell you why I am not in that plan and I will let you know. One of the activities that I took up with the Mohan, dear friend, was with the Mohan. As you will see when the slide comes up, you will see that uh, we wrote a manual in 1987, Moha, Ajit Bide, who is very closely associated with the MBA, we all wrote a manual. Next one. Every month 
for nearly three, four, four years and reassess the problem. When we reassess the problem, it's not there. When we reassess the problem, we saw something which was shocking. Even after 30 years, people were suffering. This time it was not only this physical suffering that had disappeared. Eyes were normal, lungs were damaged, but they were able to get out. But there was a spiritual loss. I am dramatizing it with one example. This gentleman had been continuously ill for 30 years. A Muslim gentleman, he was a national hockey player, and the staff brought him to me, saying that, please, when I saw him, I said, this person is severely depressed, suicidal, I want to admit him. He said, no, I won't get admitted. I will come every day and see you, but I will not get admitted. I said, okay, what else I can do? I started seeing him, and the field staff used to sit with me to see how I could provide help in this one. After that, she wrote this beautiful poem. Uh, the left side is about the disaster, the right side is worth reading it, and uh, I want to read it saying that first, kept awaiting them to come across or be gifted by some. Then, that's an angel, one day in his life, who fondles him gently into the meaning of living, having found verily the tale support. He gradually let go of all his grief, responding to his sincere words of love. He laid wide open the gates of his heart, and lo and behold, he was right there with him, having redeemed his uh, real self all over again. I mean, it's almost like a Christian, I mean, it was my, my Bellur days, Christian uh, uh, type of a revival. And we saw many number of them. It's just one of them uh, written by one of the staff. Similarly, this is the iconic picture similar to Pika in the St. Peter's uh, Church. Because this is Father Michael Church, who was a priest working with the fire brigade in 9 11 in New York. When the towers came down, they didn't know what was going to happen. For the first fire brigade movement, he was part of it. Because in fire brigade, there is a spiritual person all the time to go with them to provide support. Unfortunately, he was the first person to die, and that is the ironic nature of it. Equally important, three years later, when a nationwide survey was made of the psychological problems of people after the disaster, the 9 11 disaster in 2001, they found a striking difference between those who are spiritual and those who are not spiritual. The people who are spiritual had less psychological, mental health problems than those who were not spiritual. That was the biggest proof that you can get in a natural event with the general population. Similarly, the yeah. Similarly, the findings, and there is a large number of studies, I will just tell you about the next one. Uh, three studies which have been reported, which are good ones. The first one is from Wuhan, China. Uh, in the first phase of the lockdown, they studied people to look at people who are using psychological methods like flow, mindfulness, flow is living in the present, and found that those who are using this had less effect of the lockdown and the restrictions. Similarly, in another Indian study, this was done by the Vivekananda Yoga Centre, Google uh, uh, survey of a uh, uh, large number of people from all over India. Again, they found that those who were using yoga and meditation had less effect of the lockdown and all the restrictions that went with the COVID-19. Similarly, another study came out last month from Malaysia, where again, the COVID fever was less in those who are spiritual, religious, compared to the ones who are not spiritual, religious. Now, these studies are very important because these are not studies with a select population, with the general population. So, there is enough evidence to say when you are going through a difficult period, then you have this problem. The third story I want to tell you is my own story. Forgive me for that. 2013, I developed cancer. I was diagnosed with colon cancer, stage 3, I had to have surgery, or chemotherapy, it was a terrible experience. But it opened up a completely new window of life for me. No door for me. Because I realized more than the fear, more than the treatment, the question that I was asking was,
purpose. What is the meaning of that? How do I find a purpose when I know there is an uncertainty in front of me? Whether I am going to live for six months, one year, or two years, or nine years like now, and I have to look for spiritual solutions. Uh, my mentor, Dr. Reddy, Narayan Reddy, the former director, was very, very kind to me, introduced me to Sri Aravindo, and personally guided me, and I discovered. Then I decided that I must do something for people living with cancer. I started a blog post called uh, Living with Cancer and started an activity called My Emotional Health, My Choice. And I identified these 10 things, 5 things you can do to maintain your mental health exercise, sleep, nutrition, yoga meditation, and being connected. 5 things you can do when you are distressed share your feelings, journaling, music. Thinking differently in spiritual. Then I started providing honorary service to Sri Shankara Cancer Hospital and also to the Vivekananda Youth Movement in uh, Mysore Palliative Center. And then I found that spirituality is the core of the experience of majority of the people. Let me just give you three or four stories. One patient was having severe pain and I said, How do you handle it? She smiled and said, Remarkable lady, you know. Uh, she said, Look, I am like Ramana Mahashi. Ramana Mahashi, when he was asked, Do you have pain? He said, My body has pain, I don't have pain. The same thing which uh, Ramakrishna also said when he had throat cancer or uh, JK who had also uh, cancer. The second story was a lady with breast cancer, stage 4. We had palliative care only, nothing much to offer. And I always ask this question, How do you live with this? How do you make sense? She said, Doctor, I read every day Sundarkanda. Sundarkanda is a section of uh, Ramayana where Sita is in uh, Lanka and Hanuman goes and meets her uh, and brings hope. And when I read this, my pain, my suffering disappears and I see hope and I live with it. Another very senior professor in one of the colleges with uh, again severe uh, breast cancer, subsequently ovarian cancer. Every day she said, I read, uh, uh, the, I read religious texts and I see stories like Parikshit who when you are told one week more you have before you die because of something which he does to a sage. He decided that I will not enjoy things, I will not do this or that. He went out to Varanasi, he lived with the sages, he read the religious things and then uh, passed away. So I can tell you any number. The fourth one, which was told by the staff, I was not personally involved in it, was uh, a Muslim uh, gentleman with the terminal cancer. When he was told that you have a short time, he said, I don't want to stay in the hospital. He went home, he declared that he's got cancer and he's going to die. After he became, he became a chakra type of a thing, he celebrated his life before dying. And so it's possible to use spirituality as a way of dealing with the time. So, I am quite convinced that when you have a serious problem, you have the novelty crisis, you have the reality crisis, but more than that, you have the value crisis, that is the crisis of spirituality. And if someone can reach out to you to activate your spiritual resources, you will find peace, you will move from struggle to surrender and serenity. That's like this. I am coming to the end of the uh, this uh, illustration can come to some hardcore uh, medicine, hardcore uh, evidence. The last example I want to give you is something which we are doing right now in Bangalore. This program is called Enrich, that is, we are recognizing that caregivers of people with the special children have anything between two to five times more emotional health problems and physical health problem, which is very well documented all over the world. This activity developed what we developed for cancer, for parent caregivers of uh, children with special uh, children. Our organization, Association for Mental Channeling, is 10 years younger than you, that's about 60 years old. And what we do is we bring together a group of seven, eight people. We don't bring together a big group like this. We just bring together a group, we have a 10 o'clock to 4 o'clock workshop to listen to them, to give them the skills of self-care, five five things, and also develop a plan for themselves.
There are two young girls, Divya and Nishita, who work with me, two young psychologists. And uh, when I told them they must look at spirituality, sad, they can't do that, it's very really difficult. But I encourage them, take some interviews, and lo and behold, what they said like is, what they found was enormous outpouring of information, experiences, much more than what we imagined. They all came forward to talk about their spirituality much more easily than anything else. And they all had different, different. Some look at it as a gift, some look at it as an opportunity to uh, understand God, some of course thought of it as a uh, punishment for what they have done in the thing. But by and large, we found that parents were very willing to talk and parents were using spirituality as an important resource to make sense and find a path in their life. You know, we have a bit of and I will be happy to share this with you. Next time. Okay, now I have given you a lot of nice anecdotal things, tell you stories. But is there good evidence to show that spirituality does make a difference? The evidence is overwhelming. I will come to the mental health in a minute. Whether you are talking about people who have had an open heart surgery, if they were spiritual before the surgery, they are more likely to live longer. If people are on chronic renal dialysis, if they are spiritual, they are likely to have less complications. Live longer. Even in HIV, in California, a lady just taught them some nonsense, I mean, anonymous mantra, and that increased the immunity, and their response to the antiviral drugs was better, the side effects were less, and they lived longer. I can go on and go on and talk about it. But in this specific area of mental health, there is an excellent paper by Dr. Honey, uh, I, uh, which is available in the for easy download, 600 references, 20 pages long, shows that there is enough evidence to indicate benefits in terms of coping with adversity, positive emotions, well being and happiness, hope, optimism, meaning and purpose, self esteem, self self control, positive character. All of these things are well documented from a handful to 30, 40 studies for each one of these areas. Similarly, next time. Similarly, in the area of disorders, depression, anxiety, schizophrenia, bipolar, personality traits, substance abuse, in all of these things, three things come. Number one, spirituality is a very important part of the sense making of the people. Spirituality gives a better outcome for these people. Spirituality is has a better, sorry, better outcome and the person acceptance and illness is greater. The best evidence is from schizophrenia in India. You all know in 1980 there was a five year follow up of schizophrenia by uh, uh, Indian Council of Medical Research headed by Professor uh, uh, Abraham Bernays and uh, he found that among the big group in uh, Lucknow, Goa, and, uh, Lucknow, uh, the Delhi and the Bangalore, sorry, Bellore, they found that those who are spiritual had a better outcome than those without their spiritual background. So it is evidence from the international area from the Indian. Next time. Similarly, it also decreases social issues like marriage, instability, increases social support, social capital, and delinquency crime. All of this is very well documented and uh, some areas. I will come to that in a minute. For example, forgiveness related references are more than 700. More than 700 papers showing that forgiveness, even in a severe condition like cancer, increases the survival, decreases the side effects of the chemotherapy, radiotherapy, and other things, and gives better quality of life. Now, you ask me, Dr. Murthy, how does spirituality work? You know, it's so ethereal. It is like the sunlight, you have talked about it. How does it get converted into electricity or hot water? It is through five or six things. Number one, the fellowship field. Connectedness. You remember we talked about connectedness being very, very important as a mental health parameter. In point of fact, Vivek Mundi, I will show his book in a minute, who is the Surgeon General of America, has written a book called Together, showing that being connected is one of the most important mental health uh, preventive mechanisms. 
Number two, you tend to use more health promoting activities. Then you will feel the distress much less because you are not personalizing the distress, you are seeing it. Like my friend Madhu Gavan and Keith Gavan, who use church, I mean, the Bible and their belief system to understand the difficulty, the challenges they had with the, their son Aju and the last 40 years, continue to have for the last 46 years. More than that, it leads to activities like gratitude, compassion, kindness, uh, service, humor, you know, all of these are very positive things, things like this, uh, which are the components of it. That is, connection with the superpower, prayer, gratitude, forgiveness, kindness, humility, compassion, humor, acceptance, and various things. Now, these, each one of them alone is very effective. Together, they are dynamic to address any challenge that comes in front of you. Those of you who want to see evidence for that, read the Book of Joy by Dalai Lama and Desmond Tutu. You know, they have given both scientific evidence and the spiritual evidence for the same. And what is very striking in the way we look at it in Eastern countries and the West, in the West what happens is they pick up any one of them, like integrity or anything and make a whole thing out of it. While in India we tend to think of the whole thing in a composite manner, in a totality manner and don't go on to convert it into an activity. For example, forgiveness is not just a mechanical thing. For example, one group has worked in this uh, forgiveness, Ramona could be in touch with some of the very interesting uh, material from her church and her uh, experience. He says there are only four things to be done with the forgiveness. Identify the unforgiveness within you. Do the forgiveness, then work through to undo the things so that you give back something to the society. And by doing this, you will find a relief and that relief gets converted into better health in terms of immunity and all the other things that go. And each one of them, each one of them if you see, for example, this book of forgiveness is, I mean, full of stories. Sometimes you will think, you know, could it be true? And as I said, I have read enough to say all of this is true and this is where we are missing in India. In India, we present whether Sri Aurobindo or Vivekananda or uh, Chinmaya or anyone else or Christianity or anything as a package rather than as an activity. That is a challenge, I will come to that in a minute uh, uh, and address it in the next slide. Let's like the same one. Yeah. Now, I just want to tell you one uh, study which was done in Duke University called Business Based Cognitive Behavior Therapy. Do you know cognitive behavior therapy is thought of as one of the biggest progress in mental health of the last 50 years? This study which was done in Duke University did it with the five next like, five religious groups. Yes, like, and uh, they, they, they work with the Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, and Buddhism. They looked at each one of the religious texts and developed their cognitive behavior therapy based on that for Hinduism. Nali Chitani did this work from uh, California and she took Bhagavad Gita, Krishna, and Arjuna dialogue and how the cognition of Arjuna was changed by Krishna. 5000 years back, or 2500 years back, and we are talking about CBT being a big revolution in the last few years. And it's a fantastic uh, thing, all of this meeting here, give the next slide, show that CBT and RCBT were both acceptable and equally effective. In some ways, it's better than others, but it was a very successful study. And all of the manuals, all of the resources are available pro bono. You can go there next slide. Uh, and uh, you can go there and find it and uh, if anyone of you have to find it, write to me, I will send it to you. So, it is no more a hunky-panky something which is happening in the, behind the curtain or something which is uh, done in like a magic or a black magic. It is hard process. 
This year, sometime in January, February, there is a major paper showing the psychological interventions have biological variables at the level of immunity in terms of IL-6, T-cells, T-cells and all of these type of things. And I think we are going to hear a lot more of uh, the biological basis of spirituality than what we have heard so far in this area. Next slide. Now, you ask me, it's all very nice, but is there anything more that you can offer from spirituality? I am entering into a very dangerous territory by putting my neck out and saying that India is capable of addressing some universal problems with a unique Indian way of looking at it. What is it? Aging, loneliness. It is the biggest challenge. One third of Americans are thought to be lonely. Loneliness is thought to be worse than uh, obesity and smoking. And everyone is thinking of, like in this uh, model of WHO, better health services, better living condition, better environment. But no one talks about a spiritual way of looking at it. Next time. I go back to uh, that, this, uh, that's a book of uh, Vivek Murthy, again a fantastic book on healing next time. My teacher, Professor Yanandi from Chandigarh, wrote this article, Relevance of Manaprasta Ashram in Modern Times. What is this Manaprasta? He said, Murthy, there is no way you can overcome old age, loneliness, which is an essential part of growing old. You cannot look at it as a loss. Then I said, what can be done then? Think of it as a transition. Hinduism, one of the biggest contributions of Hinduism, as far as Arthur Brooks, who is a columnist of Atlantic magazine, came all the way to listen to Najur Venkatraman in Palakkad about this Varaprasa. Uh, uh, what is it that that makes sense? Four things you do as part of Varaprasa. Withdraw from the outside as much as possible. Give away as much as possible. Give your services free to people. So four, turn towards God and find a purpose and meaning in life. If you do this, then old age is no more a problem. It's a relief. It's a transition. And this, if it can be operationalized, systematized and shared and demonstrated that this is an easier, less expensive, more effective, they are looking at old age. Think about it. Think about it. If we can do that, that could save trillions of rupees that is being spent on old age homes and all sorts of things. Because in America, one third of the medical care occurs in the last one year of life. One third of it in the last one year of life. Here is an opportunity for some young people to take it out and say, I will do something based on the Manaprasa concept. Not necessarily going to the forest, but building that ideas and saying, finding peace with it. It is a question of finding peace rather than anything. Next time. Similarly, we have a challenge of grief. Do you know when you look at government, you will find about 12,000 to 13,000 articles and grief, grief therapy. When I put grief therapy in India, was zero. This particular one was an article written by Dr. Necky in 1977. I recently looked at the Indian Journal of Psychiatry. There is not a single intervention article on grief in the last 70 years of Indian Journal of Psychiatry. Except recently there is one from Prabhachandra in the COVID that past year, just a descriptive one. Why is it? The reason is not that we are not interested. The reason is we have an inbuilt grief management mechanism. That is, rituals, systems of support, even simple things like not cooking for 10 11 days, someone bringing food, eating with you, not wearing new clothes, reading every day religious texts, you can go on and on. All of these are good for mental health, good for accepting the loss of a loved one, and it is there within us. And we take it for granted like the sunshine and not think about it. Next slide. I come to the end of it. This is Malika Kapoor, who is a friend of MPA, has written a fantastic book last year called It is Okay to Reach Out for Help for Lay People about the
the cultural, uh, religious, spiritual, and self care mechanism. It's a fantastic book. I would recommend it to all of you. From childhood to adolescent to old age, she has examples of how we can use our resources to address the large problems in the community. Next slide, please. Now, I'm coming to the end of it. You will say, but it would be very nice. What does it mean to me as ordinary individual, as a member of the MPA, stay here? The first thing that I want to say to you, please look within, you have an enormous amount of resource within. I'm not talking in a philosophical manner, that when you look inside, the energy that we have is much, much more than what is outside. So, we all are capable of recovering using our own internal strength. Second, look around and see what religious, spiritual resources that you have acquired from your childhood, from your family, from your community and try to build it. You know, gratitude, compassion, kindness, journaling, reading a religious text, attending a church or a temple or a mosque, all of these things are beneficial to you and will help you recover faster, decrease the side effects and give you a better quality. So, if you are an individual looking for it, make spirituality an important part of you. Something like your shadow. Let it be sitting on your shoulder so that you can okay, put it out whenever you need. Next slide. At the family level and community level, we all need to build connectedness through small networks, religious networks, belief networks, are reaching out to help each other. Do you know during the COVID, among the elderly, if people kept in touch with other people, they did better than those who did not keep in touch. Or those people who went out even to the park or to the mall or something, did better. But this is all well documented thing. So please think of your life as a life of community, not life of the self, individual, I, I, I. Rather than teach the children, work with the community so that you are together in this country. Next slide please. As a professional, very, very important. I can't better than what Professor Burgess said in his article in 2008 in the Indian Journal of Psychiatry. Next slide please. He said, these are the things that he identified six, I have added a couple of them more. All of us need to examine our religion, spirituality. No one religion is superior or inferior or better or this one. All religions have this connected with the bigger goals and the good of the community there. We need to examine the concept in different religions, document it, make it easy for ordinary people to use it. For example, when I tell the story, I, I remember, uh, let me just tell you one more story. So this lady came to me about 30 years back when I was working in Nimhan with severe depression. What was the problem? Her brother had a chronic renal failure. She went to Bellur. Those days, Bellur had the place where they went for all these things. And uh, he didn't survive, but he needed a kidney transplant. She, couldn't, she didn't give it. She was feeling pain. And she couldn't just get over the idea that I killed my Brother, I can't get me, you know, I didn't give the thing. Then I worked with medicine, talking everything. Somewhere I got the bright idea to use the story of Buddha and the Pisago. I told her the story, which opened up a whole new, you know, the story of uh, the she goes with her uh, dead son, and the Buddha says, Go and get me some uh, oil or tindili from any house, there is no death. And she comes back and says, Everywhere there is. Then she says, Then she becomes his uh, disciple. That made a break to and we were able to go. So my own feeling is we need to look at it. The same way when uh, Krishna asked uh, sorry, uh, uh, sister, sorry, I'm not getting it. Uh, uh, what, what do you want? She said, give me trouble so that I'll be over you. You know, this is the, this is not documented. I'm sure like if, uh, if Madhu was standing here, Madhu Kamal. She would quote things from Bible, I am not so good at that. Similarly, my colleagues from Islam will quote things from there. Or Jainism, or Buddhism, Sikhism. You know, and I have included in that a whole series of uh, healing our minds lectures from the Dalai Lama Center in Delhi, which are going on these uh, days 
where, where, where you see Sikhism, um, Buddhism, all of them. Then we need to very big thing. We need to not do bodhane but sadhana. Sadhana don't say to go to the temple. You know, give them something like say, right, Sri Ramajaya, Om Namah Shivaya, or do this or you go on the tree, the temple, or the church, or the mosque, or something. So you convert the whole thing into an activity so that then most important thing is case studies. We are very poor at that. That's one of the things I showed a lot of books. In the West, if something happened, immediately they write a book. While here we, we have a lot of experience with us, but we don't talk. Then we need to standardize spiritual practices so that people can practice it beyond OBCs. Beyond OBCs, they need to be able to practice it. Then of course, we must include psychiatric history, spiritual history to be part of it, not looked out upon spiritual practices as superstition or retrograde or back project and things like that. And more important that we need to develop some tools for measurement, longitudinal studies, impact processes and uh, all these things. Just imagine, in Bangalore we had about a million population being followed from say 2010, like the Harvard study. All of you have heard of Harvard study. They have been following people for the last 75 years and came up with the idea that connectedness is the best recipe for good health. If we had anything like that from 2010, and we are looking at their lifestyle practices, yoga, meditation, blah blah blah. And the pandemic occurred. And we found what we have found cross sectionally. Longitudinally, people who are practitioners of this had less effect of the COVID. What a great contribution to them. Would you agree with me on that? In point of fact, I had suggested, I'm just saying to you the missed opportunities in 2017 to the then Health Minister Nadda and the Director of Dhamdada because the yoga thing had come up just then in 2015 saying let us do that, bring art of living, yoga, yoga, the yoga center, new hands, let's do that. We didn't do it. But I think we should think of developing this. At the, not only at the level of a million population, even at the level of the church. Look at things, when things happen, are there differences between people who have different levels of religiosity and spiritual ideas and how they practice it could be documented and reflect back to people. The same way we talk about obesity being contributing to one or the other, smoking being contributing to one or the other. Can we give credibility to these ideas so that people will own it up more easily than now? And of course we do all of these things. We would be making three things. Number one, we would be giving power to the individual. All the talk that we don't have enough resources disappears when each one of us becomes a resource. If I become my best doctor by using everything possible to be healthy, then the question of whether 7,000 psychiatrists, 70,000 psychiatrists, or 7 lakh psychiatrists doesn't matter. Number two, we are doing it something which will stay with the people forever, for lifetime. It is not for immediate particular illness or this one. Lastly, we would be bringing much bigger societal level changes, what we call social capital, when people become spiritual, care for each other and concern for each other, so we will have a much better peaceful society. Next slide, yes. I come to the end of it. Of course, when you read the, the Western literature, they are very good at breaking down things like can you shop for happiness? Can we do exercise for happiness and things like that? But in our country, I again and again say we have a rich resource of spirituality, spiritual knowledge, spiritual experiences, which in every religion that we need to harness and make it possible for other things. Next slide, please. Of course, lightheartedly we will make fun of it, saying that you know, can uh, have coffee mugs. But this mug is very good. Actually, I just ordered it. I thought I'll get it by today, but it didn't come. In one thing, all the things that we can do, think positively, move, everything is there in that mug. If only we can make it essential part of it, spirituality will become part of us and we will be in a better Next slide, please. 
I end up with a quote from a colleague who does a monthly seminar, Duke University, freely available webinar, and uh, you have the link in the uh, paper as they write to me. He says, the field of religion, spirituality, and health is growing rapidly. This was 2005. I dare to say it's moving from periphery into the mainstream of health care. All health professionals should be familiar with the research base described in this paper, know the reasons for indicating spirituality in patient care, and be able to do so in a sensible and sensitive way. He concludes, at stake in the health and well-being of our patients and satisfaction that we as health care providers experience in delivering care that addresses the whole person, body, mind and spirit. Again, just to other things, hope, concern, guidance, shame, everything is spiritual. And with these words, again I wish FBA all the success and uh, look forward to see, see the success of all of your work. Thank you again for this opportunity. <laughs> Yes, I would request the viewers to put up your questions in the chat box so that you know uh, Dr. Srinivas Murthy will be answering you. And also, you know, you people can ask it just directly on your screen. I would also request Dr. Srinivas Murthy to come on stage, please. I'm sure you would agree with me that we have listened to a very profound, powerful, spiritual talk. I don't think a psychiatrist, but a spiritual guru, if I go with that tradition. Very profound talk based on uh, India's religious traditions and spirituality. And uh, in general, the understanding of uh, religion's usefulness 
and also the clinical uh, examples with which he has challenged us how spirituality is helpful in terms of health, individual, community, family, and even at the workplace. So thank you very much. And I am sure you will have questions, something to supplement, and we will take about 20 minutes. And so you can raise your hands and ask questions or then chat, you can chat her, box you can make the questions. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Dr. Mujira, Professor and Head Department formerly in the Enhanced Department of Science and Support. My association with the Professor Shinas Mukti is for 42 years now. Uh, perhaps uh, this is the spirituality of the topic and mental health in general. Uh, what perhaps I learned from him, which will be very useful for all the practitioners in mental health and health, also family members. And uh, today's world simply bogged down with, uh, I mean, my moment, my moment here is that uh, acceptance of the differences. Accepting the differences is the uh, main cause for all the worldly problems. And uh, I still give a good the time. The road blocks for therapy is that simple principle of acceptance. <laughs> this I learned from Professor Muti. That is it. Consider one down a boat, perhaps taking the day is moving at one down a boat and then from Professor Muti. That is that is useful for throughout my career in Enhance and the PhD and as well as what is it's a simple thing to know accidents. How to accept it? And one of the anecdotes he has mentioned in the PJ Chandigarh experience is shared with me that only person with paranoid schizophrenia involved him in the information. If the person is not being informed about uh, these things, that will go in suspicion becomes. Until then, what happens is that I am a therapist, he is a patient. So that is the chemical for paradigm was there. And the paradigm shift occurred with this little sharing and a lot of things, a lot of varieties of speed of and how to deal with them. I have learned. Simple thing is that I am a therapist concept arranged from my mind in early 1980 because of Professor Mundi. Even when he was in PT Chandigarh. I have a research consultation with Professor Mukti in terms of the rehabilitation conditions in the Nandis period. So that is the one thing. Second thing is how to make family to be involved as a therapist. That is the big question. 100% of the families say that he or she is not married. We brought him, him, and you treat him. So, and that shift, simple accident. How to make the family to involved as part of it. I have asked a simple person, you brought X and Y to me and do, do you think that at least 1% of your uh, share is there for this uh, uh, situation? I guess. And uh, that is how we say that uh, making involving the family. There is a lot of anecdotes, the time is not sufficient and a simple principle of acceptance of this thing, accepting that we are not we are not solvers, we are only facilitators. So this concept I have learned from Professor Shima's working that is very helpful, but at the same time, the first principle of social work, professional social work is principle of acceptance friends, and this is what we are not we are not God, we can only facilitate what that is all technically professional science or meaning method field is called one down language. You are not solving, go to that level. That's a uh, we really I agree with most of one ethics uh, comments and uh, uh, Jacob Jones uh, initial remarks about your presentation and uh, this will be helpful for me for the future in terms of spirituality and mental health. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Yes. Yes, we can. Can I?
Yes, yes. Doctor, thank you very much for a very enlightening talk. But my question is basic. What do you mean by spirituality? How you define? I remember reading that Virata, the body, was very spiritual. He will always pray before he went out for his jacket. Because this word is body part. Spirituality. Spiritual. How do you define that? Thank you. Good evening, sir. We are extremely grateful to you for the great lecture on spirituality and mental health. In fact, this is a great opportunity. India is looking for such kind of the services. We are extremely grateful to the Medical Park Association. The first NGO registered in the country for the author of persons with mental disorders. Today we are opening up the third lectures, which is a great eye opening lectures for the whole country on behalf of the Department of Psychiatry and Social Work and the entire campus of the Nancy. We are extremely grateful to the Medical Park Association and our country of essential duty to the entire team and we pray for their good work to continue this work for many more. And I have one question to tell you, sir, Dr. Srinivas Mukhya, I have the honor how the disciplined medical professions can take up the incorporation of spiritual related dimensions in our working field. Thank you so much, sir. There are two questions in the chat box. One is how, sir, how do we integrate? Mental health and spirituality in PT curriculum. The second one, sir, I need to know how a rationalist or a peace can find talk in a binary process. Insightful session. In what way can someone experience practice spirituality without these activities? Sergeant, can I ask a question now? Sergeant, unmute and speak. Yes, I am here. Hello, I am here. Uh, the tremendous value 
from these beautiful stories are the ones who want to do something. You know? uh, but, and we do something that needs to be evidence based because already, uh, I mean, like you have rightly pointed out, generally very popular French have been mental health, but there's this general notion that it was all mambo jumbo and hacky panky and stuff like that. So if there's something evidence based that we can do, then that seems more convincing to people. So, um, so I, I was just thinking, you know, how can I kind of involve, how can I start my own initiative uh, in, this, in this field based on the fact that I have a very powerful lived experience that we talk about. So I have a long question. Thank you once again for the wonderful talk. So I am suffering from uh, multiple personality disorder, uh, uh, which is there for uh, two decades, not not good. So we. Uh, the central question that many of you have raised is how do you differentiate between religion and spiritual? Should we do it or not? Each one of us will have different opinion. My own personal feeling is spirituality functions at three levels belief, practices, and philosophy. It is different people will use like water can be ice cubes, liquid or gas. Philosophy is like gas. Every can go everywhere, get into problems. While most of us are comfortable with the solid ice form, that is the belief. I believe in it. My own personal belief is that uh, to answer many of the questions, it is moving ourselves away from the preoccupation with the body and I. Like Ramana Maharshi says, who am I? You know, the minute you keep asking this question, same thing question about JK takes it to a higher level of thought process. You know, I am simplifying things uh, to get across. My own personal feeling is the question which uh, you asked about how do you include it in the PG curriculum. All that we need to do, like I did it, I tell you another uh, small story. When I went to Shankara Cancer Hospital and said, you know, I my three services because I want to learn for myself. There was a psychiatrist who and a social worker. Dr. Murthy, why are you coming? No one comes to us. And by the time I left to stop working, I would have been working 24 hours a day. Because if you are expecting a deviancy model to come to you, say that I have anxiety and depression, no. If you ask, how are you addressing your problem? What can we do to strengthen your things? What are the questions that you are asking? Then the problem is. Turned around in a different manner. That's what really happened with our caregivers of uh, development disabilities. These two young girls were very uplifting. I said, You don't worry about it. You just ask them what helped them, what helped them. Then they came up with such story. They said, My God, we never heard this thing before. So, my own answer to all of the questions is that please think of not the divisions between the religions. Because if you look at totality, every one of them talk about connection with the higher power. If you recognize that you are one of the billions of organisms in this world, immediately most of our problems disappear in front of All our anxiety is about that and other things. No, similarly, if you recognize that your well-being depends on the well-being of others, other well-being also depends on you, your uh, problems of Conflict and other things become this. My own answer is please don't go by the dogma, go by the spirit of it. Spirit is the real sense of the spirit, no spiritual aspect of the things. Then you will find the answers. And don't look for the answers from outside, look for the answers from within. Ultimately, 
No, Swami Raghunathan, Swami Raghunathan did this last. How do you manage things? He says, when I open my eyes, I see what I can do for others. When I close my eyes, I see what can I do, see inside. So I am being a little uh, clever, but I think ultimately we all are looking for that peace within. And if we recognize it and work on it, many of the problems will be solved. Thank you very much. We understand the uh, Dr. Arthur Jagan, President of the Psychiatric Association with the audience on the online platform. Sir, do you have anything to say, any comments, any questions to our speaker? Please unmute. Please unmute. It is all going to play a privilege uh, to listen to you. And uh, what a nice and excellent presentation, making so many clarifications about this complicated and complex subject. I was just wondering that uh, this is the appropriate time that we can use your good offices to advise World Academy Association. How can we ensure the inclusion of this particular topic specifically in our? postgraduate training programs. I know that India is uh, a hub of spirituality, but 
but this is the right time that we should share this experience and expertise, specifically in those countries who have got low resource, low income, and less chances for uh, incorporating changes in the curriculum, for the, uh, especially for the trainees and train trainees in mental health. WPA will be highly applied for all the countries. Uh, Javin, thank you very much. Very nice of you to join us and also to raise this question. I don't want to be simplistic, but I want to say I learned all my spirituality during my undergraduate days in CMC Bello. Not because they taught me, because they did it by practice. I can quote Dr. Pulemu, Dr. Waki, Dr. Garde, I can quote it, Dr. Burgess. Let me just give you one example. When Dr. Burgess was retiring, I was there as an example. I said, Do you worry about what will happen to the department? The leave? No, Muthi, I don't worry. God is there, God will take He said it, I mean, I still remember it even up to 30 years. You know, so I think the most important thing is for each one of us to realize our spirituality and practice it in our work so that it gets percolated into the world. That's the way I see it. Of course, at an academic level, uh, I will write to you separately and uh, share with you uh, what can be done in this area. Thank you very much, Dr. Javed. Very nice of you to join us today. I'm glad, I'm glad you all agreed with me that we had a very, very enriching evening with this lecture on spirituality and health. Physical health, mental health, social health, health in all its aspects. Individuals, families, communities, and workplace. And uh, Dr. has brought us to the challenge that we need to return to authentic spirituality as we practice in India in order to maintain health in individuals, communities across religious traditions. The question, religiosity and spirituality is important. Religiosity is what I do with my big tradition of Sunday Holy Church. That is religious. Spirituality is this coining. He has explained somewhere spirituality is the level of maturity, mental, emotional, social maturity shown in everyday life. So there is a difference between religiosity and spirituality. There are some people who are religious, but spirituality is not any close to them. There are some people who say that we are not, I am not religious, but there is spirituality in them, I accept when they show that in their behavior. So, so this is a challenge for all of us to protect our religious traditions and spirituality specifically and go back and enrich ourselves to something. So, so that this lecture that was to have a, a new beginning. It is a Ronald W. Winnicott, a psychiatrist and a pediatrician and psychiatrist, talk about the transitional phenomenon. Religious experiences are transitional. And that the transitional phenomenon he meant. There is a, there is a third area of experience. Objective, which is here. Subjective up there, which is what I say my God experience. But in between, something happens to body and mind. And that is the transitional. This is all what our speaker has been, has been sharing with us today. And we are blessed with your talk. Dr. Murthy, God bless you and continue to be part of MBA and our writing.